Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Kelly Jerkin. I'm the branch manager of the Catherine Dixon Hoffman branch. And today we are so happy to welcome Mackenzie Reber, who is a former student assistant at this library. And she is going to talk about uh, careers in STEM, specifically for people, uh, for minorities and women. Um, all right, Mackenzie, thank you so much. And um, let's get started. Thanks for the introduction. So hello and welcome to my talk on why you should choose STEM. So the goal of this presentation is not to convince you to pursue a career in a STEM field if you are already uninterested or dislike STEM. The goal of this presentation is to help provide a clear picture on what it looks like to pursue a STEM career and encourage you to follow your dreams, regardless of the obstacles and challenges that stand in your way. Hopefully, this talk will give you a better understanding of what it means to be a STEM professional, the potential challenges you may face, as well as suggestions on how to succeed as a STEM professional. Okay, so who am I? My name is Mackenzie Reber, and I am entering my fourth year as a mechanical engineering student at Grove City College in Grove City, Pennsylvania. This summer, I am part of a program called Research Experiences for Undergrads. And it's a nationwide program sponsored by the National Science Foundation in which you can apply to join laboratories at colleges and universities across the country. I'm currently working with Iowa State University's Department of Aerospace Engineering. I am studying the transition students make from college to industry and the workplace. My research question revolves around the challenges newly hired engineers face when learning about their new roles, responsibilities, knowledge and skills required to complete their jobs. However, I am also conducting a separate study on which this presentation is based. Today, I will be sharing with you the experiences of five STEM professionals and their thoughts on how to succeed in the STEM field. So my study. So the purpose of this presentation is to share with you my findings from a study I conducted about underrepresented minority professionals in STEM. The study was qualitative which means I used interviews rather than surveys to collect my data. While most scientific research is based on quantity and numbers, such as the speed of an airplane or how much force a bridge can withstand, qualitative research focuses on the content, not the frequency or the numbers of the data, and usually involve interviews. Qualitative research is used when researchers want to better understand a particular social phenomena or someone's unique experience. For this study, I interviewed five professionals and asked them a total of six questions. Then I went through each of the interviews and I identified the various aspects of their responses. And I'll be sharing with you what I have found from analyzing each of these interviews. So, but first we must ask the question, what is STEM? And as you all probably know, STEM is an acronym for the subject areas of science, technology, engineering, and math. Within these broad topics, there are hundreds of different avenues and paths you can take depending on what you're interested in. Today, I'll be showing you what a few careers in STEM look like and what they involve. This will be a brief introduction and overview since there is a lot of crossover and different disciplines and domains. So first, science. According to the Science Council, a professional society, Science is the pursuit and application of knowledge and understanding of the natural and social world, following a systematic methodology based on evidence. So at its most basic level, science is learning about the world around you in a systematic way. One of these methods includes the science, scientific method. This involves asking a question, forming an argument, finding evidence, and seeing whether your evidence proves to be uh, true or not. So here's a list of various career paths within the domain of science. More common jobs include biology, the study of living things, chemistry, the scientific study of the properties and behavior of matter, exercise science, the study of movement and the associated functional responses and adaptations, and physics, the study of the nature and properties of matter and energy, including mechanics, heat, light, and other radiation, sound, electricity, magnetism, and the structure of atoms. Other lesser known occupational areas include food science, the study of the physical, biological, and chemical makeup of food, the causes of food deterioration, and the concepts underlying food processing. And optics, the study of sight and the behavior of light. Many of these majors can lead to jobs conducting research in a lab, as well as traveling to different sites for fieldwork and sampling. 
Secondly, is technology. In the modern world, technology has become one of the largest growing industries and fields. From your cell phone, your car, to the computer you are watching this presentation on, technology is all around us and in many cases, it's one of the biggest things that we can't live without. Much of current technological innovation focuses on robotics, the design, construction, operation, and use of robots, human-computer interaction, how humans interact with computers, and applications of virtual reality, or VR. One of the really cool research areas in human-computer interaction right now is learning how to control unmanned aerial vehicles using your body. So that would be using drones and trying to control the how they fly by either waving your arms or whatever you think involves flying. So many of these areas can lead to jobs in research and engineering, which is my next subject. They're typically known as the problem solvers. So if you are familiar with the TV show, The Big Bang Theory, one of the main characters, Sheldon Cooper, describes engineering as where the noble, semi-skilled laborers execute the vision of those who think and dream. I think Sheldon is both right and wrong in his argument. <clears throat> the term engineer can have several different meanings and depending on the context in which it's used. I believe that engineers are the so-called dreamers. In the case of mechanical engineers, while they learn how to use machinery and build different things, one of their main jobs includes design. This involves designing various parts or systems to meet certain specifications and requirements. Engineers typically need to have a high level understanding of math, physics, and knowledge of various software programs and programming languages. Their goal is to figure out how to use, how to solve various problems efficiently and safely. So if you look to the right, you'll see three different pictures. And the first one labeled with a one is Kenta Yonasaka. Kenta is a Japanese American audio engineer his job as an audio engineer involves producing recordings of live performances through balancing and adjusting sound sources using equalization, dynamics, processing, and audio effects, mixing, reproduction, and reinforcement of sound. He has worked on productions for the Rolling Stones, Marvel, and Netflix. And then number two is Dr. Shonda Bernadine. She currently works at Florida State University. She's the only African-American woman in her department where she serves as an associate professor of electrical engineering. Having had to overcome the obstacles of race and gender on her professional journey, she places great emphasis on supporting black and Hispanic female engineering students. And then finally at the bottom, number three is Tomas Gonzalez Torres. He was born in Rio Piedras in Puerto Rico and he has a bachelor of science in aerospace engineering from Iowa State University. He was the 82nd Mission Control Flight Director at NASA in 2011, and he was the first Puerto Rican Flight Director and served for five years. He earned the prestigious NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal, and he currently teaches at Iowa State University in the Aerospace Engineering Department. And one of the cool things is that through my research experience for undergrads at Iowa State, I ended up meeting him on a, one of our professional development meetings. And then lastly is mathematics. So as a mathematician, you learn quite a bit of theory, which can lead to jobs in academia, research as a theoretical mathematician, as well as jobs in industry. As a mathematician, some of the careers you could pursue include being a software developer, a data analyst, or a computer programmer. Okay, so now we know a little bit more about the different types of STEM career paths you can pursue. But the question is, how do you know if pursuing a STEM degree is the right choice for you? I know when I was in high school and debating over whether I should major in art, music, or engineering, um, I just wasn't sure. I hated math, but I love physics. So it was a pretty tough decision. And you hardly ever know in the moment if you made the right choice. So here are some of the reasons why my participants decided to choose a career in STEM. First was family. So a family member had an impact or encouraged them to pursue a STEM career. Second reason is academic proficiency or affinity. So they felt like they performed well in or they really liked STEM related academic areas or subjects such as math and science. And there's a quote at the bottom that says, I was pretty good in math and I didn't like English or writing essays and stuff, which I think most of us can relate to. And then academic environment is number three. Um, 
they were surrounded by an academic environment that strongly encouraged students to pursue a STEM-related career. One of the interesting points from one of my participants was that they ended up going to a public high school that really encouraged and almost forced their students to pursue degrees in engineering, which I thought was pretty unique. And number four is hobbies. So <clears throat> they enjoyed various games and activities that resembled or related to a STEM profession. This included games or activities that fostered a STEM related mindset, such as problem solving and designing. One participant said, I love playing with Legos and connects, building stuff. I was just fascinated with how things work. And number five is media. So they were influenced by how the media portrays STEM related careers and professions. In this case, media can refer to television shows, advertisements, books, magazines, and social media. And one of the participants said, one of my favorite TV shows growing up was Modern Marvels on History Channel and how it's made. And I guess I was intrigued too by what I saw that engineers did like on Modern Marvels, for example. And then number, number six is mentors. They were encouraged by a mentor to pursue a STEM related career. In this case, Mentors can refer to teachers, counselors, and any elder outside of the participant's family. One person said, my neighbor, his father is also an engineer, and he was, I mean, I, I wouldn't say he told me outright, but he might have hinted at it that I would be good at, that I would make a good engineer by the way we talked and whatnot. Okay, so now we know the factors that influence their decisions to pursue a career in STEM. But what are some of the challenges that they faced as underrepresented minorities in STEM? So one, which I thought was pretty interesting, there were two different situations related to COVID. Um, so one was that they, were, they had fear of being discriminated due to COVID-19. So they were nervous to continue their job due to stigma surrounding the origins of COVID-19. So one of the quotes was, I remember being a little nervous at first, like, what if someone doesn't want me on a job site because they're worried I might bring COVID? Which I think these days was a pretty big fear back in the beginning, because um, there was a lot of uh, racial hate towards Asians and Chinese people. And then the second is insufficient support. So the participant felt that their organization was not adequately supported, but um, was not adequately supporting their staff members during the pandemic. So someone said, how do we support people during this like unusual time? And I feel they've tried to take some initiatives with connecting us with mentors within the company. Um, and they refer to the organization. Um, but I feel like the motivation for it was lost in communicating that initiative. So it just fell through within a week. The third reason is racial or ethnic discrimination. So the participant felt they were treated differently due to their skin color or ethnicity. And this includes racial or ethnic microaggressions as well as others such as name calling. And then someone said, it's the little things that feel like I never had anybody straight up trying to sabotage my life or anything because I was Asian, but it's just the way people treat you at first. And number four, insufficient communication. So the participant felt that they were not able to properly communicate with others. And this includes the quality or quantity of communication. So one participant mentioned, since I wasn't born here, I guess sometimes I do have my vocabulary or sometimes I have an accent in saying things. And that makes me not comfortable in doing presentations or speeches. And five is a lack of financial capital. The participant felt that they lacked or experienced more difficulties due to their financial status. One participant mentioned, my dad being an immigrant didn't have that same built up capital that a family who's lived in this country for many gener generations might have to help their kids pay for college. And six is lack of belongingness. The participant felt separated from majority culture due to their diverse and multicultural upbringing. This includes feelings of loneliness, otherness, and identity separation. One participant said, I always felt like I wasn't really very American, which I wasn't sure if that was a good thing or not because from my family side, I'm the only one within my immediate family who was born and raised in the US. 
So I didn't want to be too separated from my family by being too American. It was kind of this weird tightrope I was walking growing up. And another participant said, being that I grew up in a multicultural family with my dad being an immigrant, I do see the world a little differently. And sometimes I don't exactly fit in with some of the white circles I inhabit. And so sometimes it does feel kind of lonely to be the only, to just feel kind of different than everyone else. So we know some of the potential challenges that minorities face in academia. So what can we do to overcome them and succeed? One big factor is seeking community. So one participant said that they started meeting more people who'd grown up in lots of different cultures and things and kind of learned that they also had similar issues that they dealt with and that really helped. So some participants sought out relationships and friendships with other people. This includes people of majority and minority backgrounds and includes general communication with other people, such as initiating small talk to encourage trust. And two is displaying competency. That one participant proved their capability within their field. However, this does not include completing extra tasks or working harder. It only pertains to doing one's job well. And one participant said, prove that you deserve to be there and that you're smart. And another is networking. So some participants mentioned that they connected with other minority professionals and that helped them get to where they are today. And one participant said, so I guess that, I guess also that community of other minorities, other international people who struggle, help you out a lot with it too, not only emotionally, but in terms of your opportunity and stuff. Some mentioned that the only people that offered to interview them for jobs were other international and minority people, um, people who empathized and understood their position. So now, what can we do to prepare? What are the steps we can take while you are in middle school, high school to prepare for college and the workforce? Uh, so one of them is pursuing learning opportunities. So if you know that you're interested in engineering, computer science or STEM related fields, try to take classes in those areas to gain a better understanding of whether or not you like the subject area and if it is worth pursuing academically. Look for STEM summer camps or STEM programs offered by local colleges in my junior year of high school, I remember participating in a two-day robotics competition at Messiah College. These experiences are often helpful because not only do they give you insight on a particular subject area, but they also expose you to a collegiate environment. One participant said, there's a lot of focus on science and math, but there's not much engineering classes, which would have been cool. So maybe take classes that focus on engineering, um, software skills, those kinds of things. And another was don't discount humanities. I know one of the quotes I mentioned was that they picked engineering because they didn't like writing. But while that could be the case, it is very important to keep up with your writing and oral presentation skills. Because even though you may know that you want to pursue a career in STEM, you can't disregard English writing and oral presentation classes. While STEM professions may involve a lesser quantity of writing, it is often helpful to be able to write concisely and coherently. These soft skills are often what will help you as a candidate to stand out from the rest. There are so many people who have the same education, skills, experience, and passions as you, but being able to communicate well is what will help you rise above the rest and obtain greater opportunities. One participant said, I wish that I'd been exposed to is more emphasis on writing and more emphasis on presentation because I think that's the key to communicating complex technology is being able to write well and talk well. So I asked all my participants what they would like to give as advice for future and incoming STEM professionals. And the first one is do what's best for you. Many participants mentioned that you have to do what's best for you because there is no set path. One participant said, there's not really a right path to going about an education or career. And that's something I've learned. People take all different paths. It's okay to take more time with your college degree, for instance, or to leave it and work for a bit and come back. Like I've met a lot of people who've done that. 
And sometimes having done something else first helped them when they went back to do their college degree because maybe they knew what they wanted to do with it and had more motivation to do well in class. Another participant said, I think the key is working in an area, a job that has your values. I think that's important because you could end up working in a place that doesn't have your values. No matter what race you are, you will have a difficult time. So if you can work in a place that not only shares your values, but has good values. And lastly, the only advice I would say for high school students would be, make sure you don't do something because your parents told you to do it. Make sure that you want to do it and make sure you, want, you focus on what you want to do. So another one was work smart, not harder. So one participant said, if you do your best, prove that you're, competently and you're competent and deserve to be there. At least a majority of people will recognize that you are. And someone else said, I think working harder would hurt because that's going, what that's going to do is that as soon as it's time for a promotion um, and you don't get it, you'll think that you've been slighted. And the only thing you can do is look back on all the hours you put in and wonder why you're not making it. Well, I think the key is to work smarter and that if I'm putting all these hours in, maybe there might be something that I'm doing wrong and might not be a good practice. So you might have to, again, communicate and say, okay, what am I doing wrong or how can I do it better? And so you need to be connected with your supervisors, your coworkers, and keep them in the loop in terms of your progress and performance. So maybe not spending so many extra hours, but the quality of your work should be important. And third is to find your squad, find your support group. And it doesn't necessarily have to be people who are always like you, but that definitely helps. Try to get out of your comfort zone as well and try to put, expose yourself or push yourself to be mixed with other people and mixed with, with other cultures and other people as well. Networking. I think networking, definitely a big thing. For most of our jobs and sometimes just having your network with your classmates and the professors, sometimes it really helps a lot. Especially when you graduate and you're first having your job, recommendations can be very big. And if you have that network with your professor and having good relationships with them, they can definitely help you. That just puts you on the top than everyone else who is just A students. So I know for me, networking is a really big deal because for other students that didn't connect with their professors early on, sometimes they have a greater difficulty asking for references, or when they do ask for references, the professors tell them, well, I don't really know who you are um, and I don't really remember you because they never made a lasting impression. So when you build up your network, it's very important because it helps you end up getting jobs and you can find connections with anyone. They mentioned classmates, professors, mentors. It's just a very important thing that helps you move up in the world. And another is applying for scholarships. So one of the challenges a participant mentioned was a lack of funding um, and financial difficulties. So nowadays there are a lot of scholarships that are opening up and many of the times people don't get them because they don't apply. So if you look for those scholarships, keep an eye out and apply to as many as you can. You might not get all of them, but at least a few are better than none. And so <laughs> one of my participants wanted to be known as Frank number five. So there are people like you in the field. There aren't as many, but we need each other. And if you feel like this is a good career path for you, I would encourage you to reach out and we will reach out to you as well. I think one of the biggest difficulties um, for underrepresented minorities who wanna pursue a degree in STEM is that they're scared because there's no representation. There's no one in these specific STEM fields that looks like them. So they think, well, maybe it just can't be done. So why should I do it if it, no one else has? So the reason that you should pursue a degree in STEM is so that there is more representation because you will be there and then future students can look up to you as well and say, I can do this and pursue their dreams. So, and lastly, Find the right professional society for you. So, along with that quote, there are plenty of ways to get connected. Um, and one of the ways is through joining professional societies. So there are plenty of professional societies that are focused on different racial or ethnic groups, um, as well as gender related. So 
The first one is the SISE, which is the Society of Asian Scientists and Engineers. Then there is the Society of Hispanic and Professional Engineers, the SHPE, as well as the National Society of Black Engineers, um, and then the Society of Women Engineers. And I know these are mostly focused on um, the engineering field, but I'm sure there are plenty of others for just scientists, but having a backing like this gives you a lot of opportunities to jobs as well as um, future opportunities for research um, and just getting connected with people who can support you. So here's some contact information if you're interested. I have listed my contact information, email you can reach me at, um, and a little biography. And then one of my participants said that they would like to be mentioned as well. So to my right is Flora Sue, and she has offered her email, LinkedIn, and DeviantArt. And she is currently an environmental engineer um, for GZA, and she graduated from the University of Vermont and has a BS in environmental engineering. Um, and then she went to MIT for her master's. And when she's not outside collecting soil and water samples or in her office crunching data, Flora can be found figure skating, reading graphic novels, or painting and drawing. So before we end, I would love for you all to follow this link. Um, it is to a little feedback form I've created, and it will just help me gauge how effective this presentation is. So thank you all so much. Um, I really appreciate your time and thank you for allowing me to present this to you.